Can you hear me now? Is that, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm, I found I've, I'm at the TUC conference in Brighton and I found a quiet spot, but I fear that people might barge in on me. So uh, I, I do ask your patience in advance. That's why I just want to follow up what Andrew's just said about, you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Well, I, th I think that's a defeatist attitude. We have to recognize that capitalism is actually on the way out. And, it's, and you know, my hope is that it is out of the way out more quickly than, than we expect. But we know that it's out of the, um, on the way out because we're having now a, a range of, cri the, the range of crises are now more frequent than they have been over the last 50 years or so. Um, they happen, you know, one upon the other. And the big crisis that we've just had in Britain recently, last Friday, the 23rd of September, when our foolish uh, chancellor chucked a hand grenade into the into the economy, um, shows how unstable and how fragile this, the international financial system is, and therefore how very likely it is to break down quite soon, in my view. Now, um, uh, I'm, I'm very much with Kevin Anderson here, that there is no non-radical um, solution to this crisis. There is no way we can simply modify capitalism and try and do it better. It's got to have to be transformed and it has, is going to have to be transformed uh, by force of, of circumstances. And the good news is that actually we've done this before. We've actually had to transform capitalism in the 1930s uh, when President Roosevelt was faced by a financial crisis and b by a massive climate crisis, namely um, the drought that's, and the erosion of soil that's that spread across all the Great Plains of the United States of America, um, the Dust Bowl, and so you know he found the capacity overnight to end the gold standard. And the gold standard in that at that time was was the globalization of the of it of the day. Government was effectively determined by Wall Street. Wall Street was in charge of the government. And he very deliberately argued that he was going to shift the government from Wall Street to a democratically institu elected institution, i.e. the American Treasury and, and uh, the presidency. So, you know, we've seen this happen before. We know it can happen again. And I'm, I'm more and more certain it has to transform because at the moment, capitalism is extraordinarily extractive and exploitative and it's reach, reaching its limits. Um, so what needs to be done? Well, first of all, we need capital controls. We need to restrain the mobility of capital. And we need, therefore, to have much greater policy autonomy as countries. And that, again, is something that's entirely doable. We're seeing it happen already. We're beginning to see the onshoring of economic activity. We're seeing the rise of protectionism, often not very progressive protectionism, as the United States, for example, becoming extraordinarily protective over its tech industries. But this onshoring of capitalism is a, is a way of actually uh, beginning the transformation because capitalism would prefer, prefer to be offshore and detached and away from regulatory oversight. That can't go on for much longer. Um, so so we, I mean, for me, there's quite a lot happening. My, my big point is this, and the thing that worried me most back in 2007, nine, um, you'll know that I wrote a book predicting the crisis, which actually I thought was blindingly obvious that it was going to come because the level of debt worldwide massively exceeded the amount of income, GDP, if whatever you call it, uh, income in the world and debts were not going to be repaid and therefore there was going to be failure, economic failure on a grand scale. What really was disheartening about that is that many on the progressive end of the political spectrum, the Greens and the Labour Party, the left, if you like, um, stood there as the system imploded and with their mouths open, in a sense, uh, thinking we didn't know this could happen. We didn't think this could happen. And I'll never forget the moment at the height of the crisis when the bankers actually believed that they were going to go to jail they actually believed that they were culpable of having precipitated this grave global financial crisis. And then to their astonishment, <laughs> far from going to jail, they were bailed out. They were made too big to jail. They were made too big to fail. And they suddenly realized they had government backing 
and they could go and speculate to their heart's delight and, and never fear losses, really. Now, the problem with that was that we weren't prepared. We weren't ready. We weren't ready for the transformation. We weren't ready for what needs to be done to undertake the transformation. I think that's changed. I think there's much greater awareness today about the way the financial system operates. We all are watching the way in which, for example, the British government, despite claiming to be austere and deeply, deeply conservative, is nevertheless found un uncountable sums of money. They don't know how much it's going to cost to bail out the energy companies between now and next year. But the talk is of 50, 60 billion pounds, and there is not a single word of dissent about that, not from the right or the left. So we know that governments are capable of mobilizing the kind of finance needed to tackle this crisis. And they can do that almost effortlessly. So despite all the threats from the markets, and so on, the markets are not blinking an eyelid about the fact that the government is going to find, I don't know, 60, 100 billion pounds with which to deal with this energy crisis. So I think there's far greater awareness than there was, that's what cheers me up, than there was in 2007-9, when there was a great deal of ignorance and when Andrew and I were part of a small group that produced the Green New Deal report. I still think the Green New Deal is the plan B. I still think it is the instrument that we need for transformation. It's become unfashionable in the United States, mainly because it's been attacked viciously from the left of all things. But, it's, but there is no other plan for transforming the financial system in order to enable us to tackle the, uh, the problems in the ecosystem, to put that very vaguely. Um, but we have a plan B. We developed it in 2007 line. It kind of lost, uh, it didn't attract enough attention, but it's been around the world now and everyone knows there is a plan. The Americans have always, stress plan, uh, the Green New Deal has been a great big technology uh, program of, you know, finding all kinds of, uh, they, they, they need public transport, they do need to spend money on infrastructure in the United States. But the, the way it was promoted in the United States was about how technology will save us essentially. And we know that's not the case. There was nothing and there is virtually nothing said in the United States about how we need to transform Wall Street. But that's not the case in Europe and that's not the case here in Britain. And I think to an extent, it's not the case in Africa either. So um, there's much greater awareness than there was before 2007, nine. And that cheers me up. That makes me feel we've got a plan B. We know what to do. We've just got to do it. And the opportunity in my view is not very far away. So I'll stop on that note. And can I apologize in advance? I'm at this TUC meeting and I, I have to go soon, I'm afraid. So I do apologize. 